Uh, man, welcome to the people that are here for the first time. I remember when I first went to community, I was like, man, am I, am I gonna get a message or what? <laughs> you know, uh, I remember the first time I went to community, we did like, there was like five birthdays, and then there was like announcements. I was like, dang, this is, this is cool. I mean, it's different. But it's like, that's what it's all about. That's what church should be, right? It's like, is the community, like we know every single person in this room, like, I think it's, it's, it's hard when you go to a big church and, like, nobody really knows each other. You just go in, hear the message, and you bounce out. It's like you avoid talking to people. That's, that's just me, at least. I avoid talking to people. But I love community because we make it an emphasis that you're going to know people in here because this is, like, your spiritual family. Like Barry said, it's your spiritual family, and we're all on the same path of trying to grow closer to Jesus. So welcome you. Welcome you if you're here for the first time. Uh, you know, I'll be honest with you, like, daylight savings messed me up. Did anybody else feel that way? Yes, it messed me up. Now, I sleep late, like, anyways, but when it went from, like, 2 a.m. to, like, 4 a.m. or whatever it was, I was like, dang, I felt like I, I, I really felt that. I was already up. And I didn't sleep till, like, 5 a.m. I was like, man, that, like, none of the things that I wanted to do today, like, none of that really happened, so I feel like I'm all over the place. Um, and I was feeling nervous about coming up here and talking to you guys, and I was like, you know what? I'm just have a conversation with you guys, all right? This is a conversation. I am not, not up here as someone who is higher than anybody else. I'm the same level as you guys, and I'm just telling you guys what God has taught me, um, and I'm excited about it. So for the past few weeks, we've been in Mark, uh, the Gospel of Mark. Uh, today we are in Mark chapter 4, uh, verses 35 through 41. That's going to be the bulk of our text. So, uh, you know, when someone important walks in the room, like in a wedding, the bride comes down, like everybody stands. Could we all stand for the reading of God's word? Could we have that reverence and respect for God's word? Mark 4, 35. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? That is the word of the Lord today. All God's people say it. Amen. Amen. Please have a seat. So, Father God, I just thank you for your word. I thank you um, for your presence. I thank you for every person here. I just pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds, and fill us with the spirit. Your word says if any of us lacks wisdom, we could ask you and you will give it to us, God. So I just pray for that wisdom, pray for that knowledge, and we thank you in advance for it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So whenever I'm reading the Bible, I ask myself three questions. If you have trouble reading the Bible, you don't know what to do, follow this. Three questions, all right? First one is, what just happened? All right? You want to consider the context of what just happened. Don't just read a Bible verse. You got to have 20-20 vision, 20 verses before. 20 verses after, you know what I'm saying? Understand what's going on. Secondly is, what does this tell me about God? Because the Bible is not about you. The Bible is about God. The Bible is about Jesus. Everything revolves around Jesus, the main person in the story. But what's exciting about it is that you play a role in the story. So the third question you ask is, what does this tell me about myself? So the first question, what just happened? Well, we didn't actually read what the disciples were doing in those verses, but I'll make it simple for you guys. Uh, It had been a long day of them teaching many people. Uh, One of the the most famous Jesus parables, the parable of the sower, uh, that was before this, and we're probably going to have to come back to to that one because it's so good. But it's been a long day of teaching. A lot of people, a lot of crowds, uh, so they've been doing that all day, all right? Secondly, Jesus and his disciples get in the boat, And they dip out the place. They need to go on to the other side and leave. All right? And then uh, as they are leaving, as they are in the boat, 
a storm hits, and water begins to fill the boat. Disciples start panicking. And while they're panicking, while everybody is wondering, like, what is going on, Jesus is still asleep during the storm. He's chilling. He's tired. He's knocked out. All right? So the disciples go and wake Jesus up. And when they say that, uh, Jesus says, you know, have you no faith? And then he rebukes and calms the storm. And then lastly, the disciples are amazed and question who Jesus is. So that's what just happened. And I think this is, you know, the question, what does this tell me about God? This is a great, like, illustration in the Bible where it shows who Jesus really is. So we're going to answer that. Jesus is fully God and fully man. Fully God, fully man. This is a hard, essential doctrine that we all must have right, okay? This is, not only does this separate Christianity versus other religions, this separates Christianity from, like, other religions that think they're Christians because of this belief right here. And so it's important. Why is this important? Why is Jesus fully God, fully man? Like, what do we do with this information? What are we supposed to do? Well, in order to worship God, which is what we're all here to do, in order to love God, we have to know who God is, right? We're not trying to do something that's like blind faith, you know, or I'm, I'm praying to some God. If any God is out there, I'm praying, I'm just going to throw out a universal prayer and hopefully I get the right one. Now, I want community church, we are going to know as a church, we're going to know sound doctrine and we're going to know who God is. God is Jesus. Now, where do I get that point? Like, how do I get that out of the story, right? Um, looking at the whole picture, really, well, verse 38, but he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. I don't know why that term, asleep on the cushion, like, that just really humanizes Jesus for me. It's like he's tired, a long day, he needs some rest after speaking in front of crowds. I do the same thing. After I preach, I go home and sleep. Because I'm tired, I'm exhausted. I can't imagine, because Jesus was preaching to thousands and thousands of people. I'm preaching to like 30 or 40. So I can't imagine how tired Jesus is. But again, that shows the, the humanness of Jesus, right? He's tired, he sleeps, um, he eats, you know what I'm saying? So he went to the bathroom, he's fully man. But Jesus was not any more human than you and I, okay? Fully man, fully God. Now, this is a super deep theological term I'm about to use. It's a super deep theological subject. And I'm about to tell you guys a super deep, deep theological term. You might not ever use this term again. <laughs> but, but I want you guys to be aware of it. Just to point out how essential of a doctrine that Jesus being fully God and fully man is. All right? So... Take this point down and research on your own. Remember, anytime me or Barry preach, like research what we say later on and then learn for yourself. You know what I'm saying? So this, this term right here is the term that describes Jesus being fully man and fully God. It is this, hypostatic union. Jesus is fully man and fully God. Jesus has two natures, God and man. See, Jesus never stops being God, but he enters into a human body. Uh, where do we get this from? Philippians 2. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So God, the creator of everything, the sun, the moon, the stars, in Colossians 1, it says he created everything visible and invisible. So he created, you know, the spiritual world things like angels and, and demons. That God becomes a human being. And not only that, God, the creator of every single thing, of every person in this room, of every single star out there, God allows people his creation, his people, to kill him. And not only that, death on a cross, which is the most severe and, like, embarrassing death at that time. You know what I'm saying? So 
Why would God, someone of God's status, want to empty himself? Why would he do that? Because of love, right? Love is, is the answer. And again, this is something that all religions wrestle with. And just to give you guys the contrary, like Islam, they believe that Jesus never got crucified. They believe that he was saved. They believe Allah saved Jesus from ever going through that crucifixion. Um, Jews believe that he was just a person. He wasn't God. You know what I'm saying? So every relig religion out there is going to give you a different image of who Jesus is. But uh, just want to emphasize that this is the, the, the dividing factor and this is essential to the faith. Jesus is fully God, fully man. And community exists. Again, we exist to make disciples and to develop worshipers of God. That's what we desire every, every person in here. Become a worshiper of God. And in order to do that, we have to have this clear vision on who God is. We've got to know who God is. We're not just going to close our eyes and hope we're praying to the right God. We're not going to call God the universe. We're not going to call God the higher power. We're going to call him by name, Jesus. Jesus is God. Jesus didn't become God, all right? That's something that's important. Jesus doesn't become God. God, he became a human. You know what I'm saying? You see what that difference is? He didn't become, like, he didn't ever start to become God. He's always been God. Like, that's what the birth, that's what Christmas is all about. It's like the birth of Jesus doesn't mean the beginning of existence of Jesus. It just means the beginning of existence as like a human, in human form. So Jesus was human to where he gets tired, he sleeps, he eats, he goes to the bathroom, fully man. Yet he wakes up and is able to calm the waves and the storm. He's able to forgive sins. He created the heavens and the earth, Colossians 1, 15 and 16, fully God. Y'all get me on that? Fully man, fully God. Moving on. Verse 36 and 37. And leaving the crowd, they took with him them in the boat just as he was. And other boats were with him. And the great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. So, again... This had been a long day of teaching. They were teaching with Jesus. Disciples are teaching thousands in the crowd. And then, not only that, they leave with Jesus. So Jesus is with them in the boat. And what happens? Still, 37, a great windstorm happens. So, what does that teach me? Hard times will happen in your life, even as a believer in Christ. Still gonna happen. Now, let's be honest, this, this sucks, right? That sounds like a very dark thing to say, especially the year 2020 was, right? Everybody experienced some kind of loss, some kind of uh, job loss, or some kind of sickness in the family. And it's like, it's natural to feel like, this is the question that I feel like a lot of people start to ask, is like, why would God allow this? If God is so good, why would God allow this storm to happen in my life? Why would God allow the storm to happen in the boat? Right? Why does he allow this? Thanks, mother. That's why I miss having you here. <laughs> you know, um, verse 38, uh, but he was in the stern asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? So even the disciples asked, why would God allow this stuff to happen? So you're not alone when you ask this question. It's all good. It's natural. Why would God allow these things, right? Um, you know, I make it a point to minister to people everywhere I go, whether it be at the gym, my boxing gym, or, or, or work. Um, I love telling people about Jesus. I love having conversations based around faith. Uh, I love meeting people who are also Christians that I didn't know. But once I find out they're a Christian, and like, I, I use this analogy all the time. It's like our spiritual Wi-Fi connects. We just automatically become best friends. Like me and Brittany just became best friends. And I just met her today. <laughs> First time here. Like the spirit knows, you know what I'm saying? So I love when I make those connections with people. But let me tell you this. When I go out and tell people about Jesus, it ain't always good. It's not always good. Uh, some people get mad when you bring up God. Some people will laugh at you. I remember I was ministering to a person. I'm a, uh, I'm a boxing trainer also. And uh, I like to know the people that I'm training. And then it was kind of an older lady 
it was after the class. I wanted to get to know her, who she is, and then, you know, one thing less than another, and I'm always making it a point to bring up faith with every person. I'm sneaky. I'm playing chess sometimes. Like, huh, how can I bring up God? Like, if I ask this, I'm going to ask this, and I'm bringing up God that way. That's just what I do. That's my mind. Um, anyways, I asked her if she believes in Jesus and if she goes to church. And you know what she did? She laughed in my face and said, I don't believe in that BS. I was like, geez, lady. <laughs> just trained you? Like, you talk to your trainer like that? It's crazy. Well, <laughs> you know, um, back when I was uh, in 2011, uh, like, talking to atheists, first of all, is something that, that really intrigued me before. Matter of fact, like, that's, that's the one thing that really pushed me to grow more in my, in my faith and my knowledge was having conversations with atheists, Right? So back in uh, 2011, this is before I was a born-again believer. I was, I've always been, you know, a believer. I grew up as a Catholic and always grew up going to church. But I don't really consider myself born again because I didn't really know what all that stuff meant, right? Um, I was at a party, and everyone is drinking. Everybody's drunk, playing beer pong and all that stuff. And people tend to love talking to me about God when they're drunk. I don't, I don't know why. Like... Like, like, again, this is before I was doing all this stuff, before I was born again, but I was always putting out uh, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, because I was boxing, and then every time I won a fight, I, I'll glory to God. So I was very vocal about my faith. So I'm at a party, and I remember a friend coming towards me, and I'm like, oh, here we go. He, he, he's arrogantly telling me the reasons why God doesn't exist. Oh, because evolution is, is real. There's no proof of God existing. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can't come up with a reason why God exists. Or the Bible is man-made. Can you, like, picture that scenario? Like, everybody's drunk, and <laughs> everybody's around me, and, then, like, all of a sudden, all the pressure is on me and this conversation. And to be honest, at that time, I didn't even know the answers. I didn't even know how to answer those questions. So I walked away, like, defeated. Like, I was just saying, oh, man, you know, you just got to have faith. It's got to have faith, you know, believe God exists. But then that's like not really a satisfying answer to a, well, a dr drunk person <laughs> and then an angry atheist. You know what I'm saying? So it's like that makes you look bad because you weren't able to answer that. You know what I'm saying? So I, I didn't have an answer. And I'd be lying if I said I wasn't discouraged. And it made me question my faith and why I believed. I was discouraged. I don't know these answers. But then I started to pray, all right? So this, I, like a couple days later, I started to pray. I asked, God, show me if you are real. Like, give me the answers to this because I don't know. Like, I'm struggling right now. I was posting on all kinds of different forums and stuff at the time. Remember Christian forums? Do people still talk on forums? I don't, I don't know. I feel like Reddit, is that still a thing? I feel like everything is Facebook now, so I don't know. Anyways, um, I was on a Christian forum just asking questions like, what do I do? What, you know what I'm saying? Like, I wasn't really plugged into a church at that time. So I was confused, and I was asking God to teach me. And then I randomly picked up this book called uh, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. It's by Frank Turek. And so I started to read all these different books. Uh, a book I love is Cold Case Christianity by J. Warner Wallace, which is about, like, historical evidence on why the Gospels are reliable started watching all these different apologetics videos and all these different theology things, and uh, I started to grab, get a grasp of why God is real. Like, why does God exist? Like, why there is proof that God exists, you know what I'm saying? So, um, I saw him again, and uh, I ran up on him. I, that sounds bad, huh? Like, you know when you, someone's, you cuss at somebody and then you get them back. I ran up on them. Uh, I ran up on them in like a Christian way. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, hey, what's up with all that, took, that stuff he was talking, man? I got the answers right now. So I wasn't really like that. But uh, I found, okay, so I found, I had the answers. I ran up on them and I presented the facts. These are facts beyond a reasonable doubt, reasonable doubt, all right? So these are facts that not only Christian scientists will believe, but like atheist scientists will believe as well, all right? So I have all these facts, so now the one thing that discouraged me from believing in God, the one thing that might be discouraging everybody in here from sharing their faith with people, that being like you don't know the answer, like you don't know how to, you don't know everything about the faith, for me, that was no longer an issue. 
I was equipped. So now I can confidently talk to people about faith and, uh, you know, I feel like I have the answers. I don't know every single thing, right? I still have questions all the time. I was talking to Imelda for uh, hours talking about, you know, this sermon pretty much. You know what I'm saying? So I'm still learning, but I have a good grasp of why Christianity is true. Historically, logically, philosophically, scientifically, you know what I'm saying? So because I could talk about that confidently, I should be able to change and convert every single person I talk to, right? Wrong. They still don't believe. That person still didn't believe. And this is the most valuable lesson I've learned when talking to people about Christianity for my faith and everybody else's faith, learning about people's faith journey. It's, it's this, is that when, when it comes to people rejecting God, intellectual reasons is just a smokescreen. Intellectual reasons is just a smoke smoke screen. It's something they'll hide behind to cover the real reason why they don't believe in God. It's all it's, it's fake. So, if that's true, so why don't people believe then? Right? That's what 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 causes them to believe? Well, not believe. Well, I'll tell you this: from my experience and conversations that I've had, and like quite frankly, the Bible, uh, why people don't believe. Number one is this: pride. People do not belong to believe in God. They don't want to believe in God because of pride. Like, uh, they don't want to submit their lives to someone who is higher than them. They want to be the Lord over their own life. They want to be in control. They don't want to live up to the standards. And so if I reject the idea of God existing, I can live however I want to live. So I'll just tell people, you know what? Evolution proves that God doesn't exist. I could go sleep with my girlfriend and do all this stuff. God doesn't exist. I'm just going to ignore it. I could go out, smoke weed, get drunk every single day. It don't matter because God doesn't exist. I don't believe in God. They want to be Lord over their own life. Pride is a killer. And it comes in many different ways, right? Pride is applicable to a lot of things in our life. Um, that's dangerous. Pride is dangerous on so many levels. You know, last week, Pastor Barry talked about uh, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Ultimately, that's pride. Pride. Because, you know, in Mark 3, they see, the, the Pharisees see the miracles that Jesus is doing. They see how he's helping people. A lot of people are coming to him and being healed. Uh, and then they say, oh, you know what? He casts out demons because he himself is a demon. It's like, how does that make sense, right? Well, it's pride. It's pride. They don't want to give up their status in that community as a Jewish culture, they don't want to give it up to Jesus. See, it's pride. And again, that is, you're on your way to blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is the unforgivable sin. They suppress the truth. So number two is this. What's another reason? Misconceptions. Misconceptions in the faith. That's why people don't believe in God. Because, listen, what, what does this mean? Like something bad has happened in your life. Something tragic happened in your life. Childhood trauma, uh, a sickness in your family, the loss of a loved one. Like you're getting fired from your job, you know what I'm saying? Now you can't provide for your family. And so they become angry with God. And so they refuse to submit their lives to God. They're angry. With that misconception, that's also a form of pride too, right? Because the reason, it gets deeper than that. Now, think about this. These two reasons, these reasons are a whole lot deeper than just head knowledge, right? There's no amount of apologetics that I will know that will convince people that this is why they really don't believe. Like, this hits the spirit, you know what I'm saying? So when you get to this level of relationship and evangelism and understanding why people don't believe, like, I no longer care to give people facts. I mean, I could give them, right? I, I could give them if they want to. I could tell them about apologetics and all that stuff, but it's like I no longer care to give them that because I want to find out the real reason why you don't believe. Like apologetics and theology and all that stuff, those are just subjects. It gives us insight on who God is and how he works, but the problem goes deeper. I don't want to talk to them about a subject. I want to introduce them to the God who can heal their deepest and darkest wounds. You know what I'm saying? The real issue, pridefulness, misunderstanding, 
Misunderstanding, his, this is a misunderstanding right here, that if you believe in God, that only good things will happen to you. And I wish that was the case, but it's just simply, it's not true. You don't get that anywhere in the Bible, right? So, the, like, I think Jesus himself says it. So, John 16, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And Jesus is saying that to his disciples. And you know what happened to the disciples after the, Jesus said this? After he resurrects from the grave and ascends into heaven? All 12 of those disciples, they spend the rest of their lives going to different regions, spreading the gospel, the message of Jesus, the good news that saves people. But they were also imprisoned. They were also beat up. Ultimately, they died violent deaths. The only one that wasn't was John, who, was, who died quarantined on an island by himself. Can you imagine that? That's like the ultimate stay-at-home order on an island by yourself. Dang. All that stuff for believing in Jesus. Now, see, like, that's why, like, why would anybody want to be a Christian from a worldly standpoint? Like, Jesus says you're going to have trouble, and Jesus says that, like, you know, uh, or Paul says anybody who desires to live a godly life will be persecuted. And so Christianity can be very unattractive to people. Like, believe in God, and then that means I'm going to get beat up and persecuted for the rest of my life? I'm good. <laughs> I don't want to do that. You know what I'm saying? And that's why, like, th there's a thing called the prosperity gospel that, that says if you believe in God, you donate all your money, then God will bless you. Then you have everything good. That's the prosperity gospel. And that is not the gospel that we teach here at community, and that's not the gospel that the Bible teaches, right? So these are all misconceptions about the faith. So why would anyone want to be a Christian? Why? Nothing but bad things happen to you afterwards, right? Well, one is this, because when you become a Christian, you've truly experienced your life be transformed by God above all else. The word of your testimony, that's, that's, that's number one. And not just that. Why should you be, believe, uh, believe in Christianity? They say you're kind of on the fence right now. You don't know what to do with your faith. That's cool. Let me tell you this. This is why you should believe in Christ. It's because the faith, with faith in Christ and the promises he gives for eternity gives you the power to endure the hardships of today. Faith in Christ and the promises he gives for eternity gives you the power to endure the hardships of today. Keep your eyes up. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Romans 8, something, Romans 8, 18, I think. Uh, suffer, the suffering we're facing doesn't compare to what's prepared of what's to come, the glory that's going to be revealed to us. That's the mindset that we keep. So, man, rest in peace to my brother Anthony Garza. Can we clap it up for Anthony Garza one more time? That was a huge deal, man. Why do I say that? Because he was such a huge part of my faith journey. I just joined, me and him just joined community for the first time, right? And I've been a Christian longer than him. I've been Christian for like seven years. But Anthony had this knowledge and all this wisdom of the faith that it's like, man, how do you know all these things, right? Well, this is the thing about Anthony. Like, he lived, his, his life was way, taken way too early. But here's one thing. If there's one thing for sure is that Anthony lived his last years dedicated and devoted to living for Christ. Loving people, sharing the gospel with people, giving to people. Jesus changed his life. You know what I'm saying? And people, it's, it's funny when people would tell me about Anthony, they'd be like, yeah, Anthony used to be a bad dude. And Anthony would tell me about the times he was in prison. I, was like, I don't believe you, man, because <laughs> he seemed like too nice of a dude to do all these mean things to people, like robbing people. Like, I don't believe you, bro. But Jesus changed his life. Anthony lived his and everybody's in here's purpose, which is to live a life believing in Christ, following Christ. And so, although his life was taken due to the fallen, broken, sinfulness world that we live in temporarily, because of his faith in Christ, he now lives in the presence of God eternally. Heaven is not just a nice concept to comfort people who are mourning. Heaven is a reality that is reserved only for people who have put their faith in Jesus. Heaven's a reality. 
So message to anyone going through a hard time in your life. Everybody's going through some kind of hard time in life. You know what I'm saying? Message to anyone questioning their faith in God. Message to anyone angry at God because they don't understand why something happened. Anyone questioning why, why did God allow this? People ask me this all the time. Why would God allow this? Why would God allow the family? Like, I'm comfortable with saying the answer, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not God. God is omniscient. That means all-knowing. I'm not omniscient. And so what do I tell them? I tell them to ask God. God is not afraid of your questions. I asked God about when I didn't know all those other things about, you know, the, the faith and stuff. Like, God, teach me this. I don't understand it. And then what did God do? He gave me that understanding. You know what I'm saying? So ask God if you have these questions. Secondly is this. Seek God. See God. Hebrews 11.6 6 says uh, God rewards those who diligently seek him, and he rewards those. You know what I'm saying? So what does he reward you with? His presence. He rewards you with wisdom, understanding. You know what I'm saying? So don't abandon your faith in God because God is still in control. God is still in the boat. Amen? So what does this mean? Like how do we apply all this stuff, right? Well, Let's, look, let's read at verse 38 again. Um, where is that at? Uh, but he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Going through a hard time. So what does that mean? That uh, in tough times... Don't run from Jesus, run to Jesus. The tough times hit, you know, the boat is, is starting to sink. Uh, where is that at? Verse uh, 39, where, like, where it says, like, the, the water is starting to fill the boat. I don't know why I start to think of, like, the Titanic. You know, everybody starts jumping off the boat, you know what I'm saying? Uh, people start to play music. I don't know, the Titanic comes into my mind. But um, it's a habit for people to... Uh, Run to different things other than Jesus. Because the second something tough hits in their life, they turn to alcohol. They will turn to drugs. They will turn to that toxic relationship that they know they, they, know they shouldn't be in, but it brings that comfort. So I'm just going to be in that relationship. You know what I'm saying? We do anything for comfort. The problem is, the problem is that when you do that, you're only getting temporary relief. Or you're only getting a temporary solution. But with that temporariness, temporariness, is that word? Probably not. <laughs> temporariness, um, you are getting long-term effects. And that just leaves you digging yourself in a hole that's going to be hard to dig yourself out of. So what does running to Jesus mean, Right? Because that sounds like a cliche answer, a cop-out answer. It sounds like something that you, you know, it's a song, something that you might get on a T-shirt. Like, what does that actually mean? What does uh, trusting God in tough situations mean? Well, I'll tell you. When something bad happens, run to Jesus. Not in a physical sense. Like when little Ezekiel hits his head, he can physically run to Barry, Right? We can't do that because it's not physical. We are living in a spiritual. So, so you run to Jesus in a spiritual sense. Faith in God. Another word for faith is trust, all right? So one of the biggest acts of faith that anybody, all of us are able to do, the biggest act of faith is prayer. Prayer is something that we all do by faith. Why? Because we can't see God, but we believe he exists. And it's by faith that we believe that he listens. It's by faith that we believe that he cares. And it's by faith we believe that he answers. But see, don't get this confused. The purpose of prayer is not to receive every single thing that you're praying for. As if prayer is like wishes, God is the genie. It's not the purpose of prayer. Ultimately... Above anything else, many different def def definitions of prayer, above all else, prayer is aligning yourself with the will of God. 
I believe there's many ways to grow your faith. Um, you could do it by certain outreaches. You go to read the Bible. You listen to different podcasts. All those stuff. Amazing. Ultimately, the Bible says faith comes from hearing the word. So hear the word any way that you can, right? That's all I say. But I believe the more you pray, the more you're exercising your faith in him. And with that faith in him is going to come trust. You trust God for whatever is happening in your life. And if God allowed this storm, verse 38 through 40, to teach the disciples to put their faith in him, then God allowed the storm in your life to teach you to put your faith in him. So what happens when the disciples run to Jesus? Verse 39, and he awoke and rebuked the wind and, uh, and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. He said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? What happens? They, their, their storm is calm. The, the, the storm is calm, right? Uh, see, people think that peace is when everything around you is good. You got no complaints, nothing bad is going on. You know what I'm saying? Everything is cool. Everything is going how it should be. But true peace is when everything around you is chaotic and you know that God is with you in that chaos. But see, we want God to remove that problem. Then we will have peace. Like God, like the disciples probably wanted God to remove like all the water or, or just have them teleport across to the sea. Like, man, you're God. Why are we still in this boat? We could teleport. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that's what, you know, we think that God should remove these problems. But uh, no, like that's not going to happen. The problems will still remain the same. They're still in the water with water all around them. You know what I'm saying? The wind can come up at any time that they are sailing. And the possibility of another storm hitting is there. They might have been tripping the whole way as they were still in that boat. But being in the presence of Jesus is greater than any problem you will face. Being in the presence of Jesus is bigger than any problem you will face. Run to Jesus. You see, I believe that uh, God is whatever, is, is what we need in whatever situation we're in. So if you are sick, you know somebody who is sick, somebody has COVID, like God is our healer. If you're experiencing loss, death to somebody, God is our comforter. But you see in verse 38, what do they call Jesus? Teacher. And I looked up the definition of teacher because, like, when I'm bored, I'll just be Googling random words and see what they mean. Anybody else do that? I don't know. I just feel like I need to be smarter. So <laughs> I looked up the definition of what teacher is. There's a lot of different definitions, but this is what a teacher is. A teacher, in some contexts, an educator, is a person who helps students to acquire knowledge, competence, and virtue. That's what teacher means. So in times that we don't understand, God is our teacher. But you will miss what he's trying to teach you if you take your eyes off him. You're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. My favorite verse, Romans 8, 28, it says that all, uh, we know for those who love God, all things, everybody say all things. All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, this does not mean that everything, everything that happens in your life will be good. It means that whatever bad situation you're facing, God can actually turn it around and use it for your good. I love that song that we were singing earlier. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. God can use that to help shape you, to refine you, to teach you things that you wouldn't have learned otherwise. As I remember when uh, you turn, like, this is how God is perf like, personally the good in my life because I've experienced the goodness of God. When tough times hit in my life, I was one of those things. I was staying in a toxic relationship, going with this girl I know I shouldn't have. That was my comfort. And I dig myself in a hole 
that was super hard for me to get out. But this is when I experienced the goodness of God, is when I dug myself in the hole, but Jesus came and picked me up out of it. You know what I'm saying? Jesus will save you. Faith in God changes your entire outlook on life. It is not just something you do on Sundays. It's not something you do on Wednesdays. By the way, men, if y'all want to come on Wednesdays, me and Matt is there. Raise your hand, Matt. He's a good guy. Matt shares all these his stories and all the things that God is teaching him. I invite every, all the men to come out and read the Bible with us and talk about God with us, everything you're going on in your life. But faith is more than just Sunday and a Wednesday thing. Faith in God changes your entire outlook on life. Um, that's my last point. Mike, I want, if you want to come up here, we're going to close this out. Um, what do we do with this information, right? Because I gave you guys three points, a lot of different Bible verses. Like, what are we going to do about this? Because it's so cool to, like, hear a message, hear the word, and then it's like, the rest, the rest of the week, it's like, oh, what do I do now? Well, I'm going to tell y'all. I got one point for you guys, okay? I'm going to make this easy. There's actually, like, three points. Three points. Hey, three, three points and one. Three and one. Imelda, three and one. Like, Trinity. Y'all get that? Come on, man. That's how you know it's from the Holy Spirit. All right. Read his word, pray, and submit to him daily. Now, um... In Hebrews 4, okay, I don't think I put it up there. I didn't put it up there. Okay, in Hebrews 4, it says that uh, Jesus was like man, he was like all of us, and didn't sin. He faced all the temptations that we all face, but he didn't sin. So how was Jesus fully human and not able to sin? Well, I'll tell you, Jesus was not a superhuman, okay? His godliness didn't take over when he was tempted, you know what I'm saying? He was just as human as me and you are. So how did Jesus live? Well, one, Jesus lived being filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is fully man, fully God, the Trinity, God the Father, uh, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Don't forget the Holy Spirit. Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowered him to do every single thing that he did on earth. Not only that, it's the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is what resurrected him from the dead. And the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, and the same Spirit that, raised, that allowed Jesus to do all the things that he did, is the same Spirit that lives in everyone who believes in Christ. Repent of your sins and follow Christ. That's how you receive the Holy Spirit. But read his word, pray, and submit, right? So, one, how did Jesus overcome sin? is number one is he knew the scriptures. He knew the word. When Jesus was tempted by Satan himself, he didn't run away. He didn't give in to those temptations. He didn't ignore Satan. He responded with the word of God. So if Jesus does it, we should do it too. That makes sense? Jesus just reads the word. He's able to flee from temptation. We read the word. God, the word of God just fills us up. We're able to respond with all the things that the Holy Spirit has put in our head. Pray. He always prayed. Remember, this is a, 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 I see a lot of different memes like, oh, Jesus prayed to himself. How does that make sense? He's God, so he prayed to himself. Well, no. Remember, there's two natures. Jesus as man, Jesus as God. So Jesus as man prayed to God the Father. Jesus was always praying. So what does that mean? We should always be praying. If Jesus relies on prayer, we should rely on prayer. And lastly, submit to him daily. Jesus submitted his life to the will of the Father. Before he gets taken to be arrested and crucified, he pleads to God the Father, take this cup from me, which is him saying, let, let this not happen. Let's do something else. But he says, nonetheless, let your will be done. Submitted his will to the Father. These are all basic practices, right? This is nothing complex. We, this is hard to do at the same time. It's nothing complex, but the benefits, the effects will pay off, not just for this life, but eternity. You know what I'm saying? So this is where everything is based on. Read his word, pray, and submit to the Father. God loves you, 
We re- you're in this room. God is desiring after, he's seeking after you. Don't matter what you did last night, what you did last week, how many times you went to jail, how many people you done, done slept with, how many, you know, things you smoked or put into your body, God still loves you. God is still pursuing you no matter what you did. Ain't God good? Amen? Hands lifted up. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you, God, for the goodness of who you are. I thank you that you have given us your words so we can understand who you are. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you that even in the midst of trouble, you are still God. So God, fill us with the Holy Spirit. Help us understand whatever it is that you're doing in our life. We seek to please you and honor you, and we want to rely on the Holy Spirit to live this life that you have called us to live. Fill us with this Holy Spirit. Father God, I thank you. Give us the desire. Your word says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. God, fill us with that hunger and thirst for righteousness. All the things that we cannot see, God, would you show us? All the things that uh, you want us to be, God, will you make us? And all the things that you want us to know, God, would you help us know it? We pray for all of our friends and family that do not know Jesus. We pray that they will see you. And we pray for all of our friends and family that do know Jesus. We pray that they will see you more. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Everybody say it. Amen. Amen.